Are you ready for the word? Yes. We'll be in Leviticus 23 and Nehemiah 8. <coughs> Leviticus 23 and Nehemiah 8. Leviticus 23, 23. And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Shabbat, a Sabbath, the memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. So the instruction that is uh, given to us on this being the first day of the seventh month is this. You shall have a Sabbath. You shall have a memorial. And it says in the King James, a memorial of the blowing of trumpet. But what is the Hebrew there? Do you know? You do know. A memorial of what? Teruah. Not blowing a trumpet. There's The word for blow is not there. The word for trumpet is not there. It is teruah. And you'll have a holy convocation. So here we are tonight on the first day of the seventh month. On a Sabbath. A Monday night. Having a holy convocation where we will have a memorial. And we will teruah. What does teruah mean? An ear piercing shout. That is correct. So what I want to do first tonight is clarify what it means to have a memorial. That word means to have a remembrance. Now when you and I hear the word remember or remembrance, we're more likely to think of something in the past. But, but that's not actually always accurate. You can remember something in the past and future. Remembering takes in both the past and the future. Um, when you look in the scriptures, of course, there are times where we're asked to remember what's in the past. Remember when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Remember when I made you dwell in booths. But Yom Teruah is not about remembering something in the past. It's about remembering something in the future. You know, you do it. We all do it. We mark things on our calendar. January the 18th, 2025, 9 a.m., I have a dentist appointment to get my teeth clean, right? So that's put in my calendar to make me remember, right? Thursday, 2 o'clock, have your oil changed and your tires rotated. That's put in my calendar to make me remember an appointment that I have. We're marking a date in the future. It's creating a memorial. Well, Yom Teruah is that kind of memorial. It's marking something in the future. Um, Krista has been catching up on her posting, and, and she's throwing things up on YouTube and getting to our messages out of Enoch 22 and sermons like, Oh, she, oh, we, we don't go to heaven when we die, or where in she, oh, are you going, and... Those messages are upsetting people. You get all excited when you hear them, but yeah. other people hear them and they get all upset. It's bothering people who are or have been religiously indoctrinated. And by that I mean, when I say religiously indoctrinated, I mean people who have been lied to. Right. That's right. But the problem is, they love the lie. Yeah. They're not willing to consider something else because the lie tastes so good. They enjoy it. I tried to reason with one person um, this last week who expressed his dislike or her dislike to the concept of going to Shio. And the final response I got back from them was this. I'll stick with what I have learned. <laughs> okay. Well, okay then. They love the lie more than the truth. The thought of going to Sheol bothers people, but it should not. Now, if you know your Bible, if you understand Yom Teruah, during Yom Teruah, we are remembering. 
This is the time we gather together to remind ourselves that in the future there's going to be a Teruah. And at that Teruah, there's going to be a resurrection out of Sheol. Right. Yes. Then there will be a judgment, a Yom Kippur. Then there will be a Sukkot with Yahweh. All right. Tonight, Yahweh has set aside a time every year for us to meet together and remember that. Because you can get overwhelmed with life sometimes. So Yahweh says, put this on your calendar, mark it, and make sure on that night, that day, you remember there's a shout coming, and you're coming out of Sheol because of what I've done. Everything you've gone through, whew, every battle you've fought, every heartache you've ever had, Everything you've ever lost, every ridicule you've ever received, every slander that's been directed at you, every struggle, every difficulty, every suffering is all going to be worth it. Yeah. Amen. Remember that. Yeah. Don't forget it. Remember that on the first day of <laughs> some coming seventh month, there's going to be a Teruah. Yeah. And the dead in Messiah will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Yeshua in the air. So shall we ever be with Yahweh. Mark that. Remember that. The first day of the seventh month. On the first day of some seventh month, there's going to be a Teruah and a resurrection. How do we know that it's going to be on the first day of the seventh month? That the resurrection of the dead and the coming of Yeshua is going to be on the first day of the seventh month. How do we know that? Well, it's not complicated. Because that's when Yahweh told us to put it on the calendar. He wouldn't tell us to put it on the calendar if it wasn't coming. Put it on the calendar, remember. Put it on the calendar and have a memorial of a Teruah. I don't put on my calendar January the 18th, 9 a.m. dental appointment and then show up in March. Right? They're looking for me on January the 18th at 9 a.m. Yahweh said, mark the first day of the seventh month so it's not complicated. The, the words of the Apostle Paul make sense here when he said, that day shall not overtake you as a thief. It will some, but it will not overtake you as a thief. You're going to be looking for it. Amen. Also, we know that it's going to happen on the first day of the seventh month because of the examples of the first four moedim. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. Every one of those happened exactly on the day that those moedim said they would happen. Every one of them. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I didn't ask you at first to turn there, but we ought to go read that. Then we'll get to Nehemiah 8. 1 Thessalonians 4. Look in verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So this text is about people who are asleep. They have died and gone to Sheol and they sleep in peace. And Paul says, don't be in distress or in sadness or in grief concerning those who've gone ahead. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Yeshua will Yahweh bring with him. So Yahweh is going to bring them with Yeshua. Yahweh will raise them up and give them everlasting life in an incorruptible body. They're not leaving heaven coming with Yeshua. They've got to be raised up. Right? Even so, them also which sleep in Yeshua will Yahweh bring with him. Verse 15. 
For this we say unto you by the word of Yahweh, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of Yeshua shall not prevent them which are asleep. For Yeshua himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of Yahweh, and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. With a shout, a teruah, and with the trump of Yahweh. Then, <laughs> aren't you glad about the then? Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet Yeshua in the air, and so shall we ever be with Yahweh. Then, when that shout takes place, when that trumpet sounds, the dead shall rise first, then at that very moment, we shall be caught up together with them in the cloud. The word translated together, caught up together, uh, together doesn't really convey the full meaning of that. It's okay, but it doesn't convey the full meaning of that Greek word. It actually means at the exact same time. We shall be caught up at the same time with them in the clouds. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So Yom Teruah is a set apart, appointed time to gather together so that we can comfort one another and remember that the sufferings of this world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. Amen. Not even worthy for comparison. With that in mind, let's go to Nehemiah 8. Nehemiah 8 is the record of after 70 years of being in Babylonian captivity. The children of Israel, Judah, they're rebuilding Jerusalem. And they're going to celebrate Yom Teruah and Sukkot. And we read this in chapter 8, verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spoke unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which Yahweh had commanded to Israel. Notice the people requested it. Please, you've got a copy. Bring it out here and read it to us. Ezra didn't say, hey, y'all got to get together and let me read. They requested it. They required it. Bring it out. Read it to us. Read Torah to me. Got to be our heart's desire. Or give me a copy so I can read it for myself. Got to be our heart's desire. Somebody explain it to me. Let it be a lamp to my feet and a light to my path has to be our heart's desire. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and the women and those who, that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the Torah. When you're hungry for truth, four hours is not long enough. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? They read at least four hours. <clears throat> we know what day it's happening on, so... Let's see what they did on the first day of the seventh month. Nehemiah 8 verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. That is, he was standing on a platform that had been prepared for him. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. What reverence for the word of Yahweh. When you've been in a famine, when you've been in bondage, when you've been in stress, you learn to love things more than you used to. And Ezra blessed Yahweh, the great mighty one. 
And all the people answered, Amen. When you see it listed twice, Amen, Amen, that's for emphasis. They couldn't put it in bold like we do. So they wrote it twice. That means they said it loud. Amen. With lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and they worshiped Yahweh with their faces to the ground. So we're going to pause right there and notice the first thing that Ezra did. What's the, what's the first thing he did when he read Torah? He did what? He blessed, Yahweh. blessed Yahweh. What does that mean? <laughs> Say good things about. So I'm going to do that. If you agree, then you can say amen. Or you can lift your hands. Or you can bow your heads. Or you can worship Yahweh. Or you can do all of the above. But for now, I turn my attention to you, Yahweh, because you are the great mighty one. Besides you, there is no other. You are the amazing, magnificent creator of the heavens and the earth. Amen. You said, and it was. <laughs> you created a fixed, unmovable earth with foundations under it. Amen. You created the heavens over it. You created every living creature and all of it was good. Amen. And it is good. Yahweh, you in your wisdom and grace rescued mankind from annihilation by the Nephilim and watchers when you had Noah prepare an ark. Amen. What you did and how you did it, you ought to be praised forever and ever. You chose Abraham. And though he was old and Sarah's womb was shut up, you gave him descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven and nations as an inheritance. You chose Moses and through him you took down Egypt. You sent plagues on Egypt and yet provided protection for Israel. By your power you divided the Red Sea so that your people could cross on dry land, and yet you drowned Pharaoh's army when they tried to follow. Yes, you, did. you sent manna from heaven and water from a rock. Yes. <laughs> you made the sun stand still, and the moon refused to move. You pushed down the walls of Jericho at the Teruah of your people. You slew bears, lions, and giants, and nations through your servant David. You fed Elijah with ravens. And you sustained him with a handful of meal and a few drops of oil for many, many months. You took Elijah into heaven with a whirlwind and a chariot of fire. You are to be praised. Your name is to be exalted. There is none like you. You gave your only begotten son that through him we might have life. When he was slaughtered as a lamb, you raised him from the dead on the third day just like you said you would. And you've seated him at your right hand and given him a name that is above every name. Yes. And you've given to him all power, all authority by which he'll defeat all of your enemies. Angels, kings and kingdoms, men, both small and great, Everything and everyone that's ever resisted you shall be brought into submission by Him. To you be glory and honor and power and majesty and dominion and praise and riches and thanksgiving forever and ever. You're to be, you are worthy to be loved with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. Bless Yahweh, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless Yahweh, O oh my soul, and forget not all of His benefits. 
He forgives me of all of my iniquities. He heals me of all of my diseases. He has crowned me with loving kindness and tender mercy. He satisfies my mouth with good things. He renews my youth like the eagle. He executes righteousness and judgment for everyone that's oppressed. He's merciful, compassionate, and gracious, slow to anger, and overly abundant in kindness. Who is like you, O Yahweh? There is none. You are the great mighty one. You delivered me from the destruction of lies that I was taught from my youth. You delivered me from the lies that I loved and I embraced. You delivered me from being a two-fold child of hell. You opened my eyes that I had closed. You opened my ears that I had shut. You opened my heart to your truth. You, in your mercy, taught me and is teaching me your ways. You are just, good, righteous, and in you there is no shadow of turning. Now, I could go on. I could get personal here and start thanking Yahweh for every miracle He has ever worked for me. And we would be here for a while. I could talk of all the things He's ever done. But for now, let me just testify to you and say this. I can assure you from personal experience, Yahweh is good. And His mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless you, Father. Thank you. Aren't you glad that Yahweh is your Elohim? Yes, sir. Hallelujah. Well, what else did they do in Nehemiah 8 on the first day of the seventh month? Verse 9, Nehemiah, which is the Tershatha, that means a Persian officer or a governor. Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people, said unto the people, This day is holy unto Yahweh, your mighty one. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of Torah. Pay attention to this. It's easy when you read or hear Torah and you're not familiar with it to be overwhelmed by it and to feel a sense of lament. These people had been in Babylon for over 70 years. Some of them had never heard anything out of Torah. Anything. Now they're hearing it and lamenting that they have spent their lives not knowing it and not doing it. How could we not have known this? How could we not be doing this? And so they're mourning. Nehemiah said, not today. You're not going to do that today. This day is holy. You shall not lament. Instead, he said, do this. Verse 10. He said unto them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto Yahweh, neither be ye sorry, for the joy of Yahweh is your strength. So eat rich, delightful, tasty, good food. Drink sweet drinks. And bless somebody else. How wrong people are when they dismiss the Moedim of Yahweh. What they miss out on. Listen to what he's telling us to do. He said, first thing I want you to do is remember a great deliverance is coming. A resurrection out of Sheol is coming. Then, just to celebrate that, go eat something tasty. And enjoy it. And drink something sweet. And enjoy it. And then go bless somebody else. Yahweh and his feast days are awesome. But, but there's one more thing there mentioned in verse 10. 
And this is just as important because he, he keeps saying it, neither be sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's valid, necessary instruction. On this day, make sure that you reject being sorry. That Hebrew, that Hebrew word means to carve out time for worrying, anger, and pain. You know how we'll set aside some time so I can worry? Yeah. <laughs> I got this thing coming up. I need to worry about it. Yeah. <clears throat> or I, I need to be in anger or I need to just kind of sit in my pain for a while. No, no, no. Not today, he said. Yeah. Awesome. Today, there's no time, none at all, to spend in worry, anger, or pain. Gone with the wind. That's where our worry needs to be, but some of you older folks might have watched that weird movie. But at the end of it, when Rhett finally leaves, Scarlett standing at the door, seeing him leave, she says, where will I go and what will I do? Weird woman. <laughs> But as soon as she said those words, then she says, well, I can't think about that right now. If I do, I'll go crazy. I'll think about that tomorrow. <laughs> Weirdly enough, her comment came up and fits here to me. Today, I can't think about things that cause me to worry, to feel angry or pain. If I do so, I'm in disobedience to Yahweh. Hallelujah. Verse 11. So the Levites stilled all the people saying, hold your peace for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. It's the same word that was translated sorry in verse 10. So he does not want us to set aside time for worry, anger, or pain. Verse 12. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. They ate, drank, and sent portions. And what else did they do? Look in verse 12. They ate, they drank, and sent portions. And what else did they do? Made great mirth. They one up it. All right, I'm not going to worry, be in pain or anger. I'm just going to go all the way and just be in mirth. But the word is blithesomeness. That's a word you use every day, isn't it? <laughs> to be blithesome or to be in great mirth means to be so full of joy that you don't have a care in the world. So, even though they had just come out of bondage and even though they're trying to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and even though they got enemies breathing down their neck, they just chose to be full of joy and not have a care in the world on that day. So, anybody, <clears throat> pardon me, anybody who encounters us tomorrow should think we just won the lottery. <laughs> because we did. Yes, we, did. <clears throat> we have won something far greater than the lottery. You're going to be raised out of Sheol when Yeshua descends with a Teruah. Knowing that, be joyful. Bless Yahweh and bless somebody else. Stand up. Spencer, did you come prepared? Bring it up here. This is Yom Teruah, the day of the great shout. <clears throat> the trumpet is involved but the emphasis is on the shout we mistakenly were taught when the shofar sounded the walls of Jericho fell that is not true the shofar sounded to signal to the people to shout when they shouted the walls came down so in obedience to Yahweh and in remembrance Oh man, if we could just imagine that somehow. That the heavens opening up 
Yeshua descended, the dead in Christ rising, and immediately we're called up to meet him with the air. If we could imagine what kind of shout that would be, that's the kind of shout we need to give out tonight. Amen. So, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, shout. Stamp right there. Hallelujah. That's awesome. Y'all getting better and better at this. No, no shofar is going to drown y'all out. I love it. That's good. And it shouldn't. The ear piercing sound should come from us, not the shofar. Man, that's awesome. I don't know. Marie was talking to somebody on the Sabbath, I think it was, about our, the first Yom Teruah we ever celebrated. We lived at 803 Pettit Circle in Huntsville, Alabama in a subdivision in a cul-de-sac. And we gathered in our backyard. Oh, the neighbors thought we had lost our mind when we let out a, a Teruah at the end of it. But that's all right. We hadn't lost it. We'd found it. Right? Amen. Well, let's eat tasty food. Drink sweet drinks and make sure we bless somebody tomorrow.